It's that time of the year once again. Game of the year time. As is always the case, this is my personal game of the year list. A top 10 featuring the games I enjoyed most in 2020. The disclaimer is always, there are games this year I did not get a chance to play, such as Hades or 13 Sentinels, that might have had a shot, but we're only talking about games I really played and enjoyed this year. So with that in mind, sit back and enjoy the show. Doom Eternal is certainly a fascinating follow-up. While it builds on many of the elements defined in Doom 2016, the experience itself is rather unique. Now, I enjoyed the game initially, of course, but it wasn't until returning to it again months later that it really finally clicked. I discovered just how much fun the game can be. Basically, Doom Eternal is a first-person, stylish action game. Think Doom meets Devil May Cry. Once you understand this and come to grips with its resource management focused design, it really comes into its own. This is a game that demands a lot of the player, but rewards you well once you master it. The feeling of jumping around through the air, blasting demons is just remarkable and yes, often challenging. The controls are also great, responsive and crisp even when played with a gamepad, which is how this video is captured by the way. Though, honestly, the best way to play Doom Eternal is with a mouse and keyboard. I'm also a fan of the level design. There's a nice mix of puzzle solving, platforming, and combat throughout each area. You'll wander through these large facilities and ruined hellscapes, searching for keys, buttons, and other puzzle solving elements while dealing with hordes of enemies along the way. Looping back around an area you previously visited always brings a certain level of satisfaction. Beyond the central gameplay loop, however, Eternal is a gorgeous game. Powered by id Tech 7, Doom Eternal boasts a super smooth frame rate on nearly every platform. The art direction is simply stunning, the sound is powerful, and it all just feels so polished. Doom Eternal demands a lot from players, but it rewards you in kind. It's highly replayable and always a blast, which is why it comes in at number 10. It's true that Mad Stalker Full Metal 4th dates back to 1994, 2020 marks the arrival of the presumed long-dead Mega Drive version. That's right, previewed but never released, Mad Stalker for Sega's 16-bit console arrived this past fall on cartridge, and I love it. Now I get it, this may seem like a strange addition to the list, but hear me out. Mad Stalker on Mega Drive is the best version of an already solid game. It's a phenomenal mech action game that shares some similarities with Taito's exceptional Ninja Warriors again for Super Famicom. Like Taito's game, there's a surprising amount of depth to be found here, with a wide range of moves that allow for some very fluid combos within a 2D space. You'll be flipping, dashing, and slicing your way through hordes of enemies, and it always feels very satisfying. This is far more than a simple button masher. The stage design is fairly basic, yes, but it feels like a solid evolution of that Ninja Warriors formula that sits halfway between a brawler and a platform action game. I've always been a big fan of games like this, and I'm very happy with how Mad Stalker turned out. But for a 16-bit game like this to really excel, it also needs to match the gameplay with visuals and audio. Music is absolutely crucial to platformers, action games, and the like. And thankfully, Mad Stalker has one of the best soundtracks of the year. The music, composed by Keishi Yonao, is both compositionally excellent, but also technically proficient. Great sound was not a given on the Mega Drive. It takes real talent and skill to deliver tunes like this. And more impressively, it even sounds better than the X68000 original. Take a listen, I think you might agree, this is some great video game tuning. Of 
course, Mad Stalker also excels visually with huge sprites and gorgeous background work. The art direction and design of everything is just fantastic and rounds out the package. And heck, one of the main designers on Mad Stalker would go on to work at Treasure, creating many great games following this release. So for me, it was just such a joy experiencing a new yet vintage Mega Drive game in 2020 that it just had to go on my list, which is why it's number 9. In what has become one of the most divisive games of the year, The Last of Us Part II is somewhat of a guilty pleasure for me. I've always enjoyed a good stealth action game, and Part II definitely delivers on this front, but despite the controversy, I'm also a fan of its split narrative design. Yes, this is an area where the game caught a lot of flack, but I love seeing a story from two perspectives and really enjoyed the sudden mid-game flip. The characters and scenarios kept me hooked from start to finish. There's a lot of amazing moments and sequences throughout the game, and the conclusion was perfect, at least for my tastes. But in this case, it's really the gameplay that kept me going. The pacing of the game ensures that players alternate between the more open-ended, lightly guided style sequences, those which really reward skilled stealth action play, and the more scripted set piece stuff, of which there are many. I felt that I had enough agency during most of the game, but it always felt cinematic. You'll spend a lot of time making your way through large spaces packed with enemies while picking off one foe after another. This always feels satisfying, and unlike the original game, you have a lot more agency in how you approach these scenarios thanks to a very simple change, the ability to crawl. I know, that sounds silly, but in the original you spent so much time just hiding behind cover waiting for enemies to move around, but now you could take active control of the scene, which makes these sequences a whole lot more enjoyable. More importantly, the stages themselves actively encourage this type of play, at least in most situations. And really, when you do break stealth, the combat itself is quite satisfying, with a mix of beautifully animated melee action and solid gunplay. And that's really the key here, the game just feels so fluid to play, and the situations you'll find yourself in are always engaging. Naturally, as a Naughty Dog game, it also delivers exceptional visual quality. This is one of the best looking games of the entire generation. It sets new standards both in terms of world design and character animation, just a remarkable production all around. So yeah, The Last of Us Part II was one of the most memorable cinematic action games I've played in a while, which is why it comes in at number 8. I'll never forget when I first purchased the original Ryu Gagotoku game for PlayStation 2 back in Tokyo circa 2005. Since then, I've fallen in love with most entries in the series, but when it was announced that the next main installment would be a turn-based RPG, I was a little skeptical. Well, they pulled it off. This is a proper Yakuza game with a Dragon Quest-inspired twist, and it works. You have this wonderful new cast of characters, a new story set primarily in and around Yokohama, and the typical top tier storytelling you expect from the series, but the real time battle system that the series has been known for has been replaced with this turn based system instead. What I love about it though is just how fast and active it is. You have this 3D positioning system for starters, similar to something like Grandia. Characters are not simply lined up on one side of the screen, rather they position themselves around the battlefield. It lends the game a more active feel than your typical turn-based system, basically. There's also JRPG-like classes, alongside a range of single enemy or area of effect attacks. And many of those attacks are extremely over the top, which I love. The JRPG twist also means that certain missions now feature what feel like actual dungeons. Really, it's kind of silly, but I love it. The big draw of the series though for me has always been this perfect balance between dramatic storytelling, interesting environments to explore, fun side content, a weird sense of humor, and arcade games that you can play, alongside the combat, and Like a Dragon absolutely nails this. 
But really, I can't say enough good things about the storytelling. I'm such a sucker for RGG Studio's approach to narrative design. The way that a simple raise of an eyebrow can trigger strong emotions in the player, it's something really unique and special to their games. Equally impressive is how they're able to bounce between these hyper-serious moments and the more light-hearted stuff. You wouldn't think it would work, but it does. So yeah, it's fair to say that the shift to a turn-based battle system is a great match for the series, and due to the new cast of characters, it's also a great place to begin if you've never played one of these games. So if you're looking for something a little different than your typical game, give this a shot and find out why it comes in at number 7. This is Proteus, and its inclusion might seem a little strange, after all technically this is still an early access game, but the fact is, what's here is so good and so polished that all development could cease tomorrow and it would still be a fantastic game. Now at its core, Proteus is a game in the mold of classic Doom and build engine shooters, fused with a modern visual feature set. You'll explore vast stages full of keycard locked doors, while mowing down hordes of enemies along the way. What makes this special, however, is this perfect combination of top-tier level design, satisfying core mechanics, and a super unique presentation. Obviously, for any shooter, the simple act of pointing and shooting needs to feel great if the game is to stand out, and this is one area where Proteus really shines. Each hit and spurt of blood as you pull the trigger hits hard in a way that keeps you going. Each and every weapon feels perfect. A key part of why it feels so good though comes down to the design decision to use sprites for weapon and enemy objects. Basically, much like classic games from the 90s, high quality 3D models are used as a base for creating bespoke frames of animation from multiple perspectives. You can use optional 3D polygon enemies in this game, but honestly, the sprites are where it's at. This is especially true for the weapons. The reason for this, though, comes down to keyframes. Just like Mortal Kombat's uppercut remains timeless to this day, pinpointing the right keyframes on each attack creates an impactful sensation, more so than what you'd get with a fully animated 3D model. Every weapon has a serious kick as a result, and the animation, stutter, and blood spurt from each enemy is perfect. It's clear that the developers spent a lot of time refining this aspect of the game. Nailing these basic actions is so critical when designing a game like this, but equally important is the level design. This is the real secret behind retro style shooters. While most modern shooters have moved in the direction of more linear open stages with arena-like battles, classic shooters are focused more on exploration-driven, puzzle-solving based stages instead. You'll crisscross on top of areas you visited, unlock new passages, find keys, and solve environmental puzzles while taking out enemies. Proteus delivers the same satisfaction you get from the best Doom and Quake maps in that sense. That moment when you find a switch or key, or walk through a tunnel and find that thing you've been looking for, only to drop back into an earlier area of the map that you recognize is extremely satisfying. Of course, the rest of the package is great too. The visuals combine point sampled, pixelated textures, and old school sprites with modern lighting techniques to deliver a game that feels like a nice blend of old and new. It's a unique look for sure, and one that feels just awesome in practice. Proteus is also complemented by a stellar soundtrack composed primarily by the now legendary Andrew Holtschuld. This thick, dark soundscape and crunchy, filthy sound effects accentuate the action perfectly. Ultimately, Proteus stands tall among my other favorite retro shooters with its exceptional level design, pitch-perfect action, and stellar presentation. This is why it comes in at number 6.
Ah yes, Demon Souls, the game that rocketed from software to success after years of publishing more obscure games, mostly on PlayStation consoles. As a longtime fan of Kingsfield, Demon Souls on PlayStation 3 felt like the final step necessary to bring its unique style of game design to a wider audience. To say it was a success is an understatement, I think. The thing is, while I played Demon Souls back when it was released, I didn't actually finish a Souls game until its first sequel, Dark Souls. Since then, I never fully went back to replay the PS3 original, having stopped about halfway through. But with the arrival of Demon's Souls on PlayStation 5, I finally reached the end. Yes, this is a remake, but what a remake it is. Demon's Souls from Bluepoint takes everything that I love about the original game, but elevates it to the next level. The quality of the visuals and the audio are simply superb. It's one of the finest looking games of the year. But that's not why it's on this list. You see, at its core, Demon's Souls is all about gameplay. I've long felt that From Software's Souls games offer this perfect marriage of modern game design sensibilities with the skill-driven progression of classic 8- and 16-bit action games. These games are challenging, but in the most satisfying way possible. This is most evident in the way that retries are handled. Die in the game, and you basically have to restart from a very distant checkpoint. But this also allows you to learn the game, learn the enemy patterns, and slowly master it. Of course, for that to work, the combat has to be good, and it is. The act of facing off against each foe is thrilling. The risk-reward you get from combat and the sense of progression as you learn the game keeps you going. The positioning and timing of every move means you can't just button mash your way through the game. Combat takes real finesse. This is then combined with some of the most exceptional 3D level design you will find in the medium. Each world is handcrafted to perfection, the feeling of discovering new areas while surviving once difficult foes keeps you coming back for more. It's a beautiful thing and something that pushed me right through to the end this time. The sense of discovery, of victory, and even defeat is very sweet indeed. Ultimately, this remake combines everything I value in great games. Tight mechanics, exceptional level design, beautiful visuals, a powerful soundscape, and a perfect level of difficulty. Bluepoint's work on reviving this game for PlayStation 5 is truly exceptional. It's rare to have a game this good right at the launch of a new system. But here we are, and that's why Demon's Souls comes in at number 5. What's this? Another remake? Yes, but there's a good reason for that. You see, the first two entries in the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater series are, without a doubt, two of the best score attack games ever made, and this remake pushes this up to the next level, resulting in something that stands as one of my favorite games not just of this year, but of the generation. It's really that good. So what's the deal then? Well, if you missed out on Tony Hawk's Pro Skater in the past, it's basically a score-driven skating game at its heart. There are elements of skate culture embedded in the game, and that is a big part of the appeal, but this is really a pure arcade game that focuses on constantly one-upping yourself as you aim for the top. And for me, it's all about building combos, finding those skate lines in each stage, and learning how to execute long combos using these lines is extremely addictive. The speed of the gameplay and razor-sharp controls really help facilitate this. Now obviously this also demands a certain level of quality in the level design itself, and Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 really excels here as well. Each stage in the game has been recreated from the ground up, and the effect is surprisingly powerful, especially if you've played these games before. You have those same great skate lines as in the original, but it all feels so fresh and new now. And this is due in part to the addition of additional combo extending tricks. Basically, things like the revert and manual are present in the game now. While it's true that Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 added the manual, the revert didn't exist until the third game. By bringing this full suite of moves to the entirety of Tony Hawk 1 and 2, the maps shine even brighter as you find new ways to maximize your combo potential. It's this mix of super tight, rock solid gameplay and gorgeous visuals then that works in tandem with the game's excellent soundtrack, which brings back most of the original music along with new tracks. For me, music is a central piece to any score-driven arcade game, and Tony Hawk nails it. 
It's been a tough decade for Tony Hawk related games of course, but that's what I love about this release. It's a perfect modernization of a near perfect game. The developers clearly understand what makes the Tony Hawk game so special and poured a ton of effort into nailing these core mechanics. It's an area where the older Tony Hawk's Pro Skater HD fell remarkably flat. This is a game I will continue to play for years to come then, and that's exactly why it comes in at number four. When it comes to combining the best of modern and retro gaming into one cohesive whole, there are few titles that do it as well as Ori and the Will of the Wisps. This gorgeous game is a fast-paced, skill-driven, Metroidvania-style platformer backed by powerful storytelling and one of the best soundtracks of the year. Okay, but what about this makes it so good? Well, firstly, there's the world itself. As with any game of this type, the level structure and world design is central to its quality. Without this, you have nothing. And thankfully, the world of Ori is absolutely massive, varied, and unbelievably beautiful to behold. But what makes this so unique compared to many other competing games is the level of finesse required to traverse it. And that's what I really love about the Ori games. You can't just stroll through the world, you need to master the art of movement. It's not just about finding new power-ups to progress through areas previously locked, you need to master each move as well. It has momentum and flow that makes the basic traversal just an absolute blast, but there's also a level of challenge to it that really keeps you playing. It's one of the key pillars in any great platform game, and Moon Studios absolutely nailed it. The combat is equally enjoyable, with all sorts of powers and possible combos available at your disposal. For a game this ornate in appearance, it's almost surprising just how fast-paced it really is. Something truly demonstrated during the amazing cinematic escape sequences peppered throughout the game. Then of course you have the presentation and storytelling. It's a simple tale, but a powerful one. One that kind of pulls at your heartstrings in a way that you might not expect from a platform game like this. Of course, a huge part of the appeal also stems from its visual design. The quality of the artwork on display is simply superb, and it's backed by exceptional technical excellence. The sheer volume of independent layers being parallaxed around the screen at high speed as you move about the world is really something impressive. When played on one of the new series consoles at 120Hz with HDR, it might just be one of the most beautiful things you'll see in games today. Now, I cannot discuss Ori without touching on the soundtrack, of course. Like the original game, the score behind this one plays such a huge role in building the atmosphere and emotion. It's a powerful, beautiful soundscape. When you step back and consider all these elements, it all starts to come together. A great platform game requires excellent level design, sharp controls, beautiful visuals, a smooth difficulty curve, and of course a great soundtrack to really grab me. And Ori nails all of them. While Monster Boy in the Cursed Kingdom remains my favorite, exploration-driven platform game of the generation, Ori and the Will of the Wisps is right behind it. And that's why, during this rather competitive year, it comes in at number three. For the last two years, I managed to include a VR game on my Game of the Year list, and thankfully, 2020 is no exception. But if you asked me two years ago, I would never have expected it to be a new Half-Life game. Yes, Half-Life Alex is a proper Half-Life game in the truest sense of the word. As with the originals, Valve has found new ways to innovate, introducing unique scenarios that take full advantage of the VR medium to deliver an extremely memorable experience. At its core, what makes Half-Life Alex so engaging is the granularity it offers. We've become accustomed to playing shooters with more traditional input devices, but Alex requires a different set of skills entirely. 
The act of firing your weapon requires aiming, much as you would an actual firearm. It requires you to manipulate the weapon to reload it. That means removing the magazine, inserting a new one, and chambering around. It also requires you to be aware of your body position. Over the course of the game, you'll find yourself moving around your room, ducking behind objects for cover, and using your hands in some interesting ways. This is what's so central to the game then, the level of immersion in interaction. It's unbelievably high. And that's not even touching on the rustles, or the gravity gloves, which allow you to manipulate objects from afar. A great mechanic that's not only fun, but solves some fundamental issues with object manipulation in VR. The game then builds upon this newfound granularity by asking players to perform these actions within a broad range of scenarios. Each chapter introduces new ideas and concepts that put these skills to the test. And this is what a good Half-Life game is all about building upon everything you've learned while constantly throwing new ideas at the player. And I really can't say enough good things about the level design and level of fidelity in your interactions either. Playing this in VR, you feel as if you're in this world in a way that you just don't get when playing on a monitor. And what a world it is! Using Valve's Source 2 engine, Half-Life Alex is one of the best looking PC games of the year. This gorgeous mix of high quality materials, beautiful animation, and stunning artwork really brings it to life. Add in an immersive soundscape, and of course the compelling story, and you have something that leaves a lasting impression long after you've put your headset down. When VR first launched all those years ago, this is the type of game I had always envisioned, and I'm thrilled that Valve made it a reality. Half-Life Alex is not just one of the best VR games on the planet, it's also one of the best games of the past decade. I know, the barrier to entry is high, but if you can find a way to play this game, do it. Then maybe you'll see why Half-Life Alex is number two. Well, it's happened again. Another Sega-adjacent game has claimed the top spot following in the footsteps of Sonic Mania and Monster Boy. Yes, Streets of Rage 4 really is that good. And I'm here to tell you why. So, to set the stage, it needs to be said that I'm a huge fan of the Mega Drive originals and feel that they are among the best brawlers ever made. But when Streets of Rage 4 was revealed, I was a little skeptical of the art direction and the mechanics. But in the end, the development team nailed it. The brawler, while simple on the surface, is not an easy genre to get right. Without the right mix of control, enemy patterns, and pacing, such games can quickly become boring. Not so with Streets of Rage 4. In fact, after thinking about it over the course of this year, I've kind of come to the opinion that Streets of Rage 4 might just be the best brawler of all time. I'm actually serious about this. So obviously, it starts with the characters and movesets. Each character has a unique selection of combos and traversal options. Axel is moderately slow, but packs some killer combos, allowing you to juggle enemies with ease. He's actually my preferred way to play the game. But characters like Cherry can run and dash all over the screen, while Adam strikes a nice balance between the two. The simple act of attacking each enemy is handled extremely well, with just the right amount of stutter on the animation alongside the impact. Strategically popping off your moves allows for some huge combos as well. And this is really the key here. You can button your way through the game up to a point, but crowd management and strategic play allow you to take your game much further. You won't get through the more difficult settings without this. Enemy placement and AI are also exceptional, with foes moving towards and around your player in just the right way. It's tough, but fair. It never feels cheap like many other arcade brawlers of the early 90s. Actual skill is rewarded. Now, the pacing of the enemy rollout is equally exceptional. Each new enemy introduced puts your skills to the test, requiring new strategies. And once they begin combining everything together, it all really heats up. I love how the game builds up to certain stages as well. The Chinatown stage, for instance, is unbelievable, especially with its martial arts themed kitchen and dojo battles. So that's kind of the basics then. The game plays like a dream, it features fantastic enemy placement, and offers interesting level design. But that's not all. The presentation plays a huge part in this. 
While the visual style was divisive initially, to say the least, I feel that it's one of the game's strengths. The art direction is gorgeous and varied. Animation is handled in the traditional style. It's not tweened, flash-like animation. Each frame is hand-drawn. And of course, the backgrounds are gorgeous as well, and the frame rate is buttery smooth on every single platform. This is backed by an exceptional soundtrack featuring a range of artists including Koshiro and Kawashima as guest composers. A game like this demands a top shelf soundtrack and the team behind the music has delivered in spades. So that's all well and good, John, but what makes this a Game of the Year candidate? Well, that's the thing. More than just about any other game on this list, Streets of Rage 4 is the kind of game you can play and replay over and over again, all while learning and mastering the moveset along the way. I've continued to return to Streets of Rage 2 and 3 over the years, and now Streets of Rage 4 makes a great follow-up that I've added to my rotation. That combined with the intense feeling of excitement and, yes, some nostalgia, just build up to something that I just love playing. This is the kind of game that reminds me why I love video games in the first place. It goes back to its roots, but expands upon what makes them great. And this is why Streets of Rage 4 is my game of the year for 2020. So there you have it, my top 10 games of the year for 2020. It's been a terrible year in many ways, but thankfully, have been a lot of great video games to help make things a little better. Some honorable mentions for me include games such as the Final Fantasy VII Remake, which if I had time for capture would have come in at the number 11 slot, Ghost of Tsushima, and Dirt 5. And there's plenty of other games as well, and that's not even getting into the retro stuff I played through this year, like the original Grandia on Sega Saturn. But I hope you enjoyed this personal list, and I can't wait to see what 2021 holds for us. That's all for now, though, so thanks for watching Digital Foundry.